uh, good day to you and wherever you are and welcome to this very topical and relevant webinar uh, that's on lessons from Uganda and Nigeria on the sort of concept of utilities 2.0. Uh, my name is Simon Trace and I'm a Principal Consultant at Oxford Policy Management uh, and I'm the Programme Director of the DFID funded Applied Research Programme on Energy and Economic Growth, EEG for short. Uh, EEG manages a programme of 25 research projects across South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, largely looking at sort of grid scale power infrastructure across four themes, uh, improving access to the grid, improving reliability of services, the efficient and productive use um, of electricity and incorporating renewables into the grid. Um, in many ways, was, I'm sorry, EEG is very, very pleased today to be supporting power for All to bring this webinar to key stakeholders and the public. In many ways, SDG 7 is one of the most solvable of the SDG goals, but it requires integration and collaboration to accelerate and provide sustainable universal access to the 700 million odd households that currently remain uh, unelectrified across the world. Uh, this webinar hopefully enables us to explore how utilities can innovate uh, and integrate with decentralized renewable energy to help bring that about. So once again, uh, a very warm welcome. We hope you find this session engaging and insightful, um, but without taking up any more of your time, I'd like to hand over and introduce Power for All CEO, Christina Skierka. Christina. Thanks so much, Simon. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Um, and before we get into the content, I wanted to first, uh, again, thank EEG and DFID for the support for today, um, as well as the Rockefeller Foundation, who has made so much of this very important work possible. Um, and, and I know that today's technical information will be absolutely fascinating and we'll learn a lot today. But we're also hoping you'll take away something else from today, which is some inspiration and hope when we're at a very dark time um, with a lot of fear and uncertainty around the world. The focus today is instead on what we can do. And to that end, we believe that there's unbelievable benefits in working together to solve problems. And, and that's not just as human beings, it also is um, between centralized and decentralized energy. So for, from that matter then, we really wanna start off our webinar with a focus on how we change the world for the better and accelerate a path to the future where there is power for all. In our next slide, um, Alessandra, if you wouldn't mind advancing, um, what I'd like to just briefly talk about is Power for All. For, for those of you who aren't familiar, we're a global campaign of over 300 partners that stretch across the entire DRE sector. Um, that includes mini grids, rooftop systems, and indeed utilities who are also um, part of this conversation today. And when we laid out our campaign strategy five years ago, one of the things we were quite focused on is the importance of being taken seriously as a sector by the global energy uh, system. And to that end, we knew that finding a way to work with utilities was critical um, to really boost the legitimacy of what decentralized energy can do to deliver um, universal access. But beyond that, we also knew that neither decentralized or centralized energy was purpose built to end energy poverty alone. So in the next slide, I wanna do just a little bit of framing to set up our conversation today, which is indeed about the traditional or utility and, and notice the singular version of that, the utility 1.0 mindset and framework. Um, to that end, uh, what I wanted to say and, and speak specifically to in the next slide to build on Simon's point uh, is about SDG 7. And as uh, we all know the difficulties here, right? We know that SDG 7 is far behind where it needs to be, especially as a great enabler of the other sustainable development goals. And one of the things that we've seen repeatedly is over the years, the central grid has been the connection choice for development dollars. Um, global investment has increased radically in the power sector two and a half times in 15 years, but at the same time, that traditional form of generation is struggling to meet demand. So with that in mind and remembering that we actually need to find a way to connect over 100 million people a year to achieve SDG 7 by, by 2030, that I think that really sets up the conversation uh, Next slide, please, um, to talk about uh, what is that, that limitation in the old way of thinking about energy. Um, just briefly on this slide to, to set up the conversation, you know, in some cases, some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, where a, a vast majority of the energy poor reside, um, you know, connections can be up to $2,000, which can be more than the annual income of the unconnected. 
new energy customers, which we might hear about from Florence as well from Umeme in a few minutes, um, new customers don't often know how to use that energy and to get everything that a connection can bring to improve their lives. And with 85% of those without energy living in rural areas, you've got a real conflict um, in terms of, next slide please, what it is that the central grid is built for. Uh, it's a great solution for dense population uh, and short distances. But when we're talking about where the energy poor reside, which is those low density, long distance situations, the economics are quite challenging. Uh, next slide, please. And to that end, just to make a few more points, um, this challenge that faces uh, the utility 1.0 framework is the limitations and the, the challenges with the business model as is to achieve uh, connections for all the energy poor. And you'll see in this slide a couple of the numbers that are really critical, I think, to the discussion today. You know, you've got these massive transmission and distribution losses in low energy access countries up to five to 10 times what you'd see in a developed country. Um, there's tons of interruptions um, and you've got a, de a deficit. Many of the utilities in, in uh, energy poor countries are loss leading. And so if we think about that and we think about those limits, it's also important to think about the benefits of the traditional energy system and what that opportunity could be if we put that old system together with the innovations that come from the decentralized renewable sector. And with that, you know, you're looking at things like these strengths that are part of the centralized system, which include not just incumbency, but it still has, there's an incredible brand around the grid. Um, there's absolutely scale and access to low cost long-term debt, which is incredibly important to achieving universal connections. But at the same time, what the decentralized energy sector brings is modularity, the ability to scale in incremental amounts and right size energy for people who are just learning to use it. There's agility, there's a deep investor interest and a real focus on customers and, and how to create energy that's custom made in many cases for um, different use levels. So with that, next slide please. Uh, about two years ago, Power for All convened with many of the people on the phone today, um, on our webinar today, uh, a group of 30 leaders in energy, about half from decentralized, half from, from centralized, and about half from the global north and half from the global south. And we didn't really know what Utilities 2.0 meant when we got together, but in our discussions, we found that we were universally uh, believing that there wasn't quite the right definition of utilities utility of the future for Sub-Saharan Africa and many parts of Southeast Asia, and that we needed to come up with a new way of thinking about actually working together. And in the next slide, I'm just briefly going to touch on what that definition ended up um, being sourced from that incredible group of people. And you'll notice that Utilities 2.0 is, is defined in a very different way. It's not top down. It's, it's not necessarily entirely a vertical system, but it's actually designed to combine the, a range of sources of energy um, that are intelligent, that are interactive and integrated, that's focused on the customer and focused on solutions to end poverty in energy sector at the lowest cost in the fastest possible time. So that vision then, I think, in the next slide is, is very well uh, described. And, and essentially what that's grown into, at least on the Power for All side, is a demonstration um, and a chance to research the benefits of integrating centralized and decentralized um, for, for three key areas. Um, to do integrated planning and finance to reduce connection costs, accelerate pace and improve affordability of energy costs. Also to look into smart integrated technologies that can improve the reliability of connections and reduce grid losses. And finally, data and finance innovations that can drive demand stimulation for all the company's bottom lines on both sides of the wires. So with that, um, our next two slides, and then I'll just uh, hand it over to Rebecca. Um, I wanted to just give acknowledgement to many of the partners. This is a small subset of all of those involved in the pilot projects that we're involved in and the, the sort of global movement around integrated energy. Um, and then I'll kick it back over to Rebecca to talk a little bit about Power for All's pilot and the research and get into the rest of the conversation. Uh, again, thank you all for being here today. Really looking forward to your questions later. Great. Thanks, Christina. Um, thank you, Christina, and thanks, uh, Simon. And on behalf of Power for All, just thank you to so many of you who've tuned in today to be part of this discussion. 
Um, I really hope that you and your loved ones are safe and sound wherever you are dialing in from. So as Christian said, um, I'm Rebecca and I lead Power for All's research engine and among other initiatives, our team coordinates the research that's behind GQOT's of the future in Uganda. So we're very excited to share this work with you and to highlight the work of our partners. Um, so Alessandra, if you could skip down into the next slide. Um, essentially, um, we'll come back to this quite often th throughout the course of the presentation, but essentially what we've been doing um, in, on the ground <clears throat> in Uganda with, um, with Meme is thinking about ways that we can demonstrate the benefits of integrating centralized and decentralized systems, as Christina was just saying. So what, we are, what we're testing is three things, really. One is whether or not integrated planning and innovative finance can actually help to reduce the connection costs and accelerate the pace and improve the affordability of connections. Second, we're trying to test the ability of smart and integrated technologies to improve reliability specifically and reduce grid losses. And then thirdly, we're looking at the implications of data and financial innovations. Can these help to drive demand stimulation for the bottom line of those involved in supplying technology and also for the customer's benefit? Next slide. Uh, so these are the partners that are involved in our exercise. Um, Christina mentioned them before, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to move us on to the next slide. And uh, so just to say a little bit about, about, Ugan about what we're doing uh, in Uganda. So essentially, um, we worked with Umemi, and Florence is going to talk about this in, in a bit of a second. But the slide before was showing you exactly what our pilot sites in Uganda look like. Um, we basically worked with Umemi to identify sites that represent what their challenge areas are. Um, <clears throat> We found a couple of sites in Makona district, which is just outside of Kampala. If you saw that slide before, um, Alessandra, uh, people will be able to see exactly what we're, what we're talking about. That's the one. Um, so these are peri-urban mixed economies, um, mixed economy communities. Um, and essentially they represent a challenge because these are, you have a, a large demand for power, but because of um, you know, projected consumption, the cost recovery becomes a challenge. So this is exactly the kind of space where uh, an integrated approach might be the best way forward. So proceed to the next slide. So again, so this is what we're doing specifically on the ground in Uganda. Um, so let me just introduce our speakers and begin the panel session. But before we get into it, let me just a few housekeeping notes. Um, first, we want you, the audience, we see people trickling in and we want you to engage as much as possible with us and with the speakers. And the way to do that is through the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your Zoom. So you're welcome to post questions generally or specific for specific speakers. Um, we'll be monitoring and responding throughout the discussion and you can upvote questions uh, that you think are important or high priority. And immediately after the panel session, we'll have a full live Q&A with the panelists to start with those questions that have risen to the top of the priority. The webinar is also being broadcast on Facebook Live. So for those of you joining us today, hello and welcome. Um, please also post your questions and similarly use the like features to upvote. And, and don't worry, we have chat monitors uh, who will migrate your top questions here for the speakers. And then finally, um, as the webinar is going through, you're gonna see a few poll questions appear on your screen. Um, and you know, just this is just for us to help to get to know you, the audience. Each poll will last about 10 to 20 seconds. So just um, respond quickly and we'll share the results in real time. Those will look like this. So now on to our panel. We've brought together leading experts in integrated approaches to help open up and really focus the conversation um, around new business models for access. Speaking us, with us today, we're going to have Florence and Subuga. Florence is currently the Chief uh, Operations Officer and an Executive Director for Umeme Limited. This is Uganda's largest electricity distribution company. Uh, where she leads over 500 employees and is responsible for the electricity access program. So Florence is our utility expert and from that perspective she's going to be explaining to us the motives and the progress behind this integrated approach in Uganda. We also have Pradeep Prasnani. Pradeep is the CEO of Connexa, branded as the energy company of the future. Pradeep was formerly deputy director at Shell Foundation where between 2010 and 2019 he supported the portfolios growth from eight to 75 companies creating what is the largest energy access program in the world through investments. So pretty no skill. And he's here to share with us about Connexus experience on the ground in Nigeria. You also have with us James Sherwood. If you can just leave it on the, um, the speaker slide, we have with us James Sherwood. James is the principal for Rocky Mountain Institute's international and electricity practice, where he works with utilities to design new business model strategies for distributed energy technologies. 
He especially works with commercial companies that are engaging in competitive processes. Um, he's done a lot of work in Nigeria with the Rural Electrification Agency, or RIA, focused on interconnecting inter undergrid mini grids and productive use stimulation. So he'll bring a strong data and business models expertise to the conversation today. And last but not least, we have Jonathan, Jonathan Phillips. Jonathan is the director at the Energy Access Project uh, at Duke University. Previously, he was senior advisor to the president and CEO at OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And before that, he, held, he led uh, private sector engagement with Power Africa at USAID. He's also held a lot of roles in US Congress and notably was one of the lead authors on the pivotal Waxman Markey uh, cap and trade bill. So Jonathan is going to lend a strong donor finance, regulatory policy, and business model perspective to the conversation. So let's just get straight into it. Um, <clears throat> as Christina, um, you know, did a great job sort of outlining the challenges of of integrated access. Um, we're we're going to just jump straight into the challenges that um, we're seeing across Sub-Saharan Africa. The first question I have is, is for Florence. Florence, uh, Christina mentioned that it's, it's um, you know, one of the challenges that we have is that we have very few successful and profitable utilities across the continent. And even where we do, they are still challenged um, with, with, the, with, with delivering widespread electricity service. Umeme is one of those very few that are um, you know, profitable. It's listed on both the Uganda and the Nairobi Stock Exchange. Uh, so why don't you describe for us the challenges that even a profitable utility faces in delivering widespread energy access? Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, before I talk about the challenges, uh, uh, if you could move to the next slide, please. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca and Christina and the speaker before for the intro. Uh, I'll just like um, the, the, the people who are with us here to get to understand who Umeme is. And uh, this is who we are. We are a, a distribution company, the largest in Uganda. We operate a 20 year uh, concession, uh, which ends in 2025. We are regulated by the Electricity Regulated Authority and we are listed on the Uganda Stock Exchange, as well as the Nairobi Stock Exchange. And um, move to the next slide, please. It's important to note, uh, before we talk about the challenges, uh, as a result of the reforms that uh, have been implemented in Uganda to understand the progress that uh, has been made so far uh, in terms, this is data um, uh, for 2018, but in terms of generation, uh, you can clearly see uh, when uh, Umeme uh, uh, was birthed in 2005, we were at 300 megawatts, uh, but we are now at 1,250. And all the other areas in terms of number of connections, as at 2019, uh, we had almost close to 1.5 million customers, uh, five times the number that we started with. And we have invested over $600 million into the network in order to, uh, to achieve um, the access numbers that you see right here. Next slide, please. Uh, why are we here? We are here to close the gap. Why partner with Power for All? Why partner with Utility Point O? We are here to close the gap. The picture that you see here is not of a school uh, with, a, with a kerosene lamp. It's a picture of a student uh, with a laptop with power, powered by Umeme. And that is our purpose. That is our vision, uh, powering communities, powering industry for a pro prosperous Uganda. So we are here, we are partnering with Utility, utility 2.0 in order to close the gap. Next slide. Um, the challenges as far as uh, Umeme is concerned, yes, we are a successful company as you so rightfully indicated. However, uh, the challenge, some of the challenges still remain. Uh, as far as access to electricity is concerned, we, uh, uh, we are currently have about 1.5 million customers connected onto the grid. In order for us to achieve universal access, 
we will have to connect uh, 5 million customers, which will require about 10 billion US dollars in order to achieve that. Uh, that is a dilemma. Uh, we have, uh, uh, in terms of financing, but as we extend uh, power to our customers, it's important to understand that that causes strain on the network. And uh, one of the big challenges is supply reliability, which also requires huge investment. But coupled with that, whereas we need to invest in order to extend power to our customers, as well as uh, improve reliability, uh, there is a push, a cry for an affordable tariff. The question is, how do we solve that dilemma? Uh, yet, uh, as we extend power further to the grid, we are seeing a decline in demand. The average consumption for the customers at the grid age is about 17 kilowatt hours per month compared to the average consumption of the domestic customers across the board, which is about 45 kilowatt hours. Whereas, um, the gap between supply and demand right now is, is really narrowing with the investment that the government has put in place, uh, where we see um, generation right now is uh, about 1,250 megawatts, but we expect that to increase to 1,800, whereas the maximum demand is seated at about 630 megawatts. Next slide, please. Great, thanks for that, Florence. And I think that that trilemma that you've just described, a lot of the audience is gonna um, is going to uh, relate to that. Um, as you can see from the polling results, um, we've got a lot of, of persons coming in from the utility sector, from the centralized energy companies, <coughs> um, from investors and donors, and interestingly, quite a number from research uh, research institutions. So, so that's really interesting to see, and just for us to get a sense of who we're speaking with. Um, given what Florence has just said, my next question, I want to come to, um, to Pradeep at Connexa, because I think in Nigeria, the situation may be a little bit different, but also very similar. Uh, here we have other actors like the Nigerian Discos, the Transmission Company of Nigeria, uh, the bulk to those challenges that Connex is promoting and, and why? Thanks. Uh, I think there were some issues with the mic on your side, but I, I have a copy of the question. So the Connex's journey uh, started uh, over three years ago whilst I was still at the foundation. We had a huge knowledge of a lot of business models that were out there that we had supported on the off-grid side but also were very concerned as to the lack of progress that was being made towards SGG7. So we looked hard at what business model innovations uh, would be needed to really unlock large pools of capital, as Florence has said, are needed to really electrify everyone and achieve SDG7. And as a result, uh, we incubated uh, Connexa. That's uh, the first utility really deploying large long-term capital in an integrated way to make grid investments, deploy off-grid technologies, add embedded generation, invest where needed in transmission, and then bolt on cutting edge services uh, and technologies. Um, in Nigeria, you're right, the situation is very different. Uh, you can see from this first slide, both Christina and Florence have spoken about this in the sense that, number one, a lot of capital is required to achieve SDG 7, but at the same time, most utilities across Africa are not able to attract capital because either they're not able to cover their costs or they're operating at a huge uh, degree of losses. In Nigeria, when we came into Nigeria two years ago, it was a very interesting time. And the value chain to us seemed to be broken and quite divided. On one hand, we had quite a lot of private sector investment in generation. On the other hand, the transmission company of Nigeria was really making an effort to upgrade the network 
But then on the other hand, you had the distribution companies that had recently been privatized that were still struggling with high degree of losses, underinvestment, poor management, lack of upgrade to their business model. And then there was this further divide that was really happening between the on-grid and the off-grid world where the on-grid players, the utilities felt that the off-grid players were really encroaching into, this ter into their territory. Nigeria is quite interesting. I mean, it's different to Uganda. Umeme is profitable, but Uganda still has a huge degree of unelectrified population. In Nigeria, you had different problems. You have around 40 to 50% of the population being electrified, number one. Most of them are either not connected to the grid or really served by weak grid. On the generation side, it's also quite bizarre. The country has an overall capacity of about five gigawatts, whereas the real consumption in the country through diesel gensets is over 20 to 25 gigawatts. So you can see that really the country is running on diesel where people are paying on a daily basis and people are running the economy on diesel. So it was quite bizarre to us that the utilities were running at a huge degree of losses. The capacity that existed in the country was more than the capacity that existed within the network, meaning that there was a huge amount of suppressed demand. So when Connexa came, what we said is we will invest in the network, we will address the issues of grid, grid, uh, weak grid, we'll improve the customer service, we will add generation where required to start addressing the suppressed demand that currently is going to diesel. And we will reduce or, or kind of get rid of this divide that exists between the on-grid and off-grid. And irrespective of where the customer is at, whether they're an urban customer or rural customer, Connexa will be able to um, uh, service them. And as a result, Connexa started exploring a business model in Nigeria where we actually partner with the existing utility. So we have a partnership with Kaduna Electric, which is one of the largest utilities in Nigeria. And what we have done is identified, if you like, a sub-concession area in our first phase that has a representation of large industrial customers, urban customers, and rural customers. And through the investment, both in on-grid, off-grid generation and technologies, we're able to upgrade the network, offer reliable and continuous service to everyone that is cheaper to the existing diesel. And as a result, start, if you like, delivering a lot of the vision that Christina spoke about in Utility 2.0. Building on what Pradeep just said, an approach that RMI has been working on with a number of partners in Nigeria is what we've called the undergrid mini grid approach, which uh, is similar and complementary, I think, to, to what Pradeep and what Lawrence have talked about. So I'll, uh, I'll say a little bit about what that is and, and how it benefits uh, the different stakeholders involved. But first, uh, thanks, Pradeep, for the fantastic overview of Nigeria. I, I think you really hit the nail on the head there. Um, and I, I want to underscore the point that both Florence and Pradeep made about the challenge of investment. I think that's really where a lot of these innovative business models are coming from, is looking to innovate on the existing utility business model to attract third party investment and finding new ways to do that. So just to say that the approach that uh, Pradeep just outlined that Connexa is taking the undergrid mini grid business model. Um, these are really just skimming the surface of what's possible. This slide that's on the screen here, I won't go into the details of it, but it's it's an overview of the different regulations that are currently on the books in Nigeria. And the, the undergrid mini grid concept that I'll talk about in a second really just focuses on one one sliver of what's possible and similar uh, similarly connects it does the same, I, I would say. So just throwing out there that this is, you know, really just um, again, kind of touching the surface of what can be done. Uh, in addition to the utilities that uh, Pradeep mentioned, I'll, I'll highlight Abuja Electricity Distribution Company as one who is really actively exploring solutions kind of across the board in terms of different regulatory avenues for uh, how to do big and small projects and utility-led and third-party-led. So with that out of the way, if we go to the next slide, the undergrid mini-grid model is 
relatively straightforward. Uh, I think it's a little different from what Pradeep described with Conexa in that rather than focusing on a larger subconcession area, it's drilling into an individual rural community. And as this graphic shows, the idea is basically for utilities and developers to work together to identify rural communities where the grid currently exists. So it's currently uh, has a utility connection, but the main grid is either providing unreliable or no power. Um, these are areas that are often difficult and expensive to improve service to, and utilities today currently don't necessarily have the capital available to make those investments to improve service. So rather than uh, waiting for the grid to improve, the concept is to install a mini grid to serve the community, and in some cases actually disconnect from the main grid altogether. Uh, as a result, the community gets reliable power, the utility can focus on improving service to its more profitable urban customers, and down the road, uh, once the main grid improves and the contract ends, the mini grid can be reintegrated to the main grid as a DER that is sort of a resilience asset at the end of a, at the end of a line. Uh, how this benefits the different stakeholders involved. So what we suggest is, is working through Nigeria's mini grid regulation, which includes a provision for this type of project and what they call a tripartite agreement which is an agreement between the community, the utility, and the developer. The community ultimately saves money, as pretty mentioned. Uh, these uh, users are currently using a lot of diesel in Nigeria. So rather than using a lot of diesel and a little bit of grid electricity when the grid is up, they get to pay a lower levelized cost of energy overall for power uh, from the mini grid. The mini grid company gets access to a profitable project, opening up a new uh, market. These sites are usually closer to larger towns and infrastructure, and there tends to be a lot of productive use uh, already present. And if we go to the next slide, uh, from the utility standpoint, uh, particularly in Nigeria, there's a huge challenge with uh, the combination of high ATC and C losses and uh, non-cost reflective tariffs. So as a result, uh, utilities tend to be losing money serving these rural communities in a lot of cases. Uh, this undergrid mini grid model allows them to rectify that, earning a usage fee for uh, allowing the mini grid to use its distribution infrastructure and serve the community. Uh, they can reduce their losses financially uh, to the point of at least breaking even. And at the end of the mini grid agreement, they're able to reconnect a community with a uh, much greater load thanks to local economic development uh, and everything that results from having reliable and affordable power for several years. So with that, I will hand it over. I'm not sure if we have Rebecca. Yes, can you hear me? Yep, yep, you're back. Sorry about that, uh, internet issues over here. I'm so sorry. Um, but I think, I think I'm back now and I, and I heard everything that you said, James. So, so thank you very much for that description of the undergrid, mini grid approach, which I think is really complementary to what Pradeep was describing before as Connex's approach. The last question I just wanna ask um, around challenges um, is about finance. And, and I'm gonna to come to Jonathan with this one because I think you know, we've been talking about technology and, and, and smart technology and so on. And I think we know that we need to leverage uh, technology, but rural electrification um, you know, has been expensive historically, even in the US and subsidy has always been a part of that equation um, from donors or, for gov or from government. So Jonathan, um, I, you know, I'm wondering if you can just talk to us about the gap that exists and what the current schools of thought and successful examples for different models of distributing subsidy looks like um, since finance is such a big part of this equation. Right. Um, thank you, Rebecca. And it's good to be with you all virtually here today. Um, so Rebecca put her finger on, you know, what I think is a really sticky reality that is important to understand. Um, and that is that it's um, difficult to impossible to reach universal electrification on a, on a purely commercial basis in many cases. Um, subsidies have a long history of being a part of electrification strategies. Um, so, you know, the question becomes, how do we rewire that public financing plumbing, so to speak, um, to be able to support new models? Um, and that's not a straightforward proposition, um, considering we have decades of experience using subsidies and concessional loans to build out grids and enable national utility companies. Um, and those have shown um, a lot of success. Billions of people have access today um, as a result of them. Um, but we've been working um, 
in this area. And I wanted to quickly introduce a couple slides if we're able to share those. Um, we started out by looking, you know, let's just get a baseline. Um, how much subsidy has been used in the past in successful electrification programs? Um, and what have those programs looked at, at like in terms of total costs? So we looked at these seven countries, um, Brazil, Chile, Tunisia, Laos, Peru, South Africa, and Thailand, during specific periods in which there was rapid electrification happening in those places. Um, and uh, a, you know, a few things to highlight here, you know, the, the left bar is going to be total cost per connection. And the right bar is going to be um, how much of that was publicly financed. Um, and the delta there is going to be what the actual cost was to the end consumer. So what we see here, you know, connection costs on average across these seven focused countries was over $1,500 per household and business. Um, that's, you know, so as you're hearing numbers earlier that, that Christina mentioned of $1,000, $2,000, those sound like a lot. And when you scale them at the level that Florence has outlined, you know, you get to big numbers. Um, but in historical context, that's what electrification costs have been. So as we see programs, um, I think the, the results-based financing program in Nigeria that's focused on mini grids is coming in with an, uh, an RBF payment of something on the order of $350. We see that um, DRE kind of renewables based off-grid programs can be relatively speaking cost competitive. Um, so uh, a couple other highlights here, uh, customers paid on average about 14%, so $210 per connection. Um, and, you know, another aspect of both Utilities 2.0 and, and a lot of electrification planning initiatives is trying to figure out how to get at productive use or powering um, services that can drive economic growth. And what we found in these seven countries is extensive programming, you know, going back into the, the 80s and 90s, where um, planning around specific sectors or, you know, areas of social value like like health clinics or public lighting and things of those nature have been going on for a long time. Um, so a lot of this electrification game is, is new business models, new technology, but a lot of the planning is gonna come back to things that we've, we've, we've done a lot and we have a lot of experience with. Um, one other quick point on this slide um, is just to mention that as you get more closer to your last mile, um, costs tend to go up, which is an obvious takeaway. But you know the Brazil example here, costs are very high in part because in the early 2000s they were in the you know the final five percent, whereas some of these other um, countries were in the easier connect groups of of the population still. Um, next slide, please. And then one other. Quick point I'll just make that is also very important in, in thinking about subsidy is this idea of population density and household incomes. So we decided to look at a basket of countries that are currently facing electrification challenges and have that as a national priority. And we looked at, you know, what are the density levels as compared to our basket of focus countries? Uh, and we found in general, you know, countries like Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, they're actually more dense than um, some of the countries that we looked at, which all other things being equal is a good thing when it comes to costs of electrification programs. It means, you know, the wires have to be strong further for, for grid access. And in the off-grid space, it means supply chains are more likely to exist, um, distribution channels uh, more likely to be intact. Um, and then the other aspect of this is income levels. And, and on the other side of things, um, these countries that are facing electrification challenges today tend to have lower household incomes than the countries that we looked at. So this is sort of a clear indicator that subsidies are going to have to play a continued important role um, in, in these efforts, whether it's through grid expansion or, or these integrated, integrated strategies. I'll save the you know, results-based financing, auctions, kind of different methods of, of distributing subsidies for, for later in the conversation. Yeah, great, thanks for that. Um, I actually think that that uh, slide before last that you showed would be quite interesting to um, our audience. You can see we've got quite a number from Sub-Saharan Africa, but also um, across uh, South Asia. 
Um, so, so, so a bit of a spread. Um, great, so thanks for that answer, uh, Jonathan. So I think what we've talked about in this round are the challenges and we have a pretty clear stage that has been set for us um, around whether the challenges with universal electrification from the access targets to the capital requirements, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure uh, investment requirements, the pressure on the tariffs, and of course, cost recovery. So let's get into the meat of the conversation <clears throat> and start looking at the business models that are helping to solve these challenges directly. <clears throat> Pretty. I want to start with you. Um, could you describe for us the business model innovation that really sits behind what you were just describing for, for Connexa? Meaning, how exactly is this all financed? Um, who are the key financing stakeholders and what are sort of the commercial relationships that are involved? Yeah, I think just uh, before I go into the detail of Connexa's business model, I think it's important to perhaps anchor our thinking in some of the things that have been said. You know, when I spoke about Nigeria earlier, we spoke about a value chain that was broken. Too much investment in generation, the transmission company moving forward with upgrades, but the distribution company still loss making. That means that the government was subsidizing the cost of transmission and generation. Jonathan made reference to, you know, the level of subsidies that were being uh, deployed historically and currently either to uh, accelerate or get to rural electrification or subsidize a broken value chain. Um, Florence talked about the cost of rural electrification and Jonathan also spoke about the declining cost of decentralized energy through, for example, the mini grid RBF in Nigeria. Um, so we thought actually, Number one, value chains are broken. Number two, the costs are rapidly declining. Number four, uh, currently uh, the distribution companies, given how badly they're being run and how underinvested they are, have no basis to go to the customer and charge cost reflective tariffs. The customer doesn't even want to engage with the utilities. There's no trust, there's no transparency. There's no technology that actually tells customers how much they're consuming, et cetera, et cetera. So we brought all of these problems and actually had a clean sheet of paper in Connexa and said, well, I think we can invest across the value chain to address the problems in an integrated way. I think we can improve the quality of service and even cost efficiently reach to those customers that are difficult to reach by bolting on off-grid technologies as part of our core value proposition. And I think we can really bring, bring transparency to that customer relationship um, and price everything at a cost which is cheaper than what they're using now. Jonathan also mentioned the productive use component. And I think that's critical. All of the utilities around the world, even those in Western economies, have the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of their consumption and revenues are driven by a small handful of customers. 20% are the ones that really are mostly the residential customers or those rural customers. But effectively, the pricing variation doesn't change that much. And I think when you are just an off-grid provider, sometimes you lack that anchor customer or you've got to create it. As a utility, even Florence can tell you the importance of what we call large commercial industrial customers or uh, maximum demand customers as the term is in, in Nigeria. So we've had to put all of it together to make this work and bankable. Now we've gone with this value proposition to the regulator and the regulator sees sense in this. You know, we're fixing the value chain, we're creating the value proposition that would make a happy customer. We're able to charge less than diesel, but still be cost reflective. And the regulators are giving us the envelope or the, the parameters in which to operate and protecting this because they see this as a model that can be replicated and scaled across Nigeria. So then when it comes to the investors, which is what I spoke about earlier, you know, one of the challenges that we saw is that given the scale of investment that is required, the current business models need some level of evolution.
to really attract that level of capital. And for us, it's been, you know, we're, we're doing work on the off-grid side and we're doing work on the generation side. We're doing work on the, on the distribution side. We're bringing it all together and we're able to attract long-term infrastructure capital that has the appropriate level of foreign exchange protections that actually make the average, the weighted cost of capital, one which is affordable for a distribution business in Africa that's trying to serve all customer segments. And that's where the innovation comes. The innovation comes in how we uh, fix the current problems. The innovation comes how we adapt and fit into the regulatory framework that exists in the country and then how we actually structure the business from a financial perspective to make it investable and, and viable. You know, distribution businesses, as Florence will tell you, you know, are constantly, because they're regulated, are constantly under pressure to make sure their weighted cost of capital is something that is in check, their returns are in check. And as a result, you know, you can't have investors in your distribution business that are seeking, you know, venture capitalist type returns. They need to be, you know, meeting the needs of, of the business. And therefore you need innovation and you need protection at the same time um, across, across the entire, well, across all components of the business. Pradeep, that was so succinct. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I really like the point about the productive use uh, component being so key to the bottom line. And on that, I actually want to uh, stay on Nigeria and, and James. I'm wondering if you could answer two questions for me. One is, um, could you describe the business models uh, for this undergrad mini grade concept that you just that you that you laid out for us before? Could you describe the business models that are appropriate? Um, for that type of intervention and what defines and what determines uh, where that model is the best fit. But also, could you talk to us about um, how this approach of the undergrid mini grid might be able to actually stimulate uh, increased demand and therefore revenues for suppliers, just jumping off of that point that Pradeep just made? Yeah, absolutely. So we did a little bit of work uh, toward the end of last year with uh, partners at Cleantech Hub, BMRC, and All On in Nigeria to really dig into what the array of business models that could be employed to develop these undergrid mini grid projects uh, would be. And uh, really, we came up with four approaches, which I'll, I'll just hit on at a high level here. And if we bring the slides up, there, we have a slide that gives the um, the high level overview of this. There we go. So. Uh, the four approaches are, are a mini grid operator led approach, which looks a lot like traditional off grid mini grid development, where the mini grid uh, developer is really leading the development of the mini grid, consulting with the utility, but kind of taking the bull by the horns. Um, this, this is the fastest option. It's the most straightforward. It's really what we would recommend that uh, utilities and developers that are looking to do this for the first time focus on, given the simplicity of the arrangement and the ability to just get out there and test something. Uh, a second model is an uh, SPV or special purpose vehicle led model uh, where a consortium of investors forms a company to invest in one or multiple mini grids. This opens the door to uh, both the ability to finance potentially larger uh, sets of projects. So to cluster multiple mini grids together and, and uh, attract capital to that a little bit more easily than one off projects. And it also opens the door to distribution company investors who uh, might be interested in investing in the SPV. That does raise a lot of kind of um, potential questions around ensuring there's a good firewall between those investors and the DISCO, which is a separate conversation. Uh, a third model is a cooperative led model, which is intended to give communities more ownership and control over a mini grid. So this can you know, really increase their buy-in, potentially leverage alternative sources of capital, drive projects with lower cost. Um, and finally, a collaborative special purpose vehicle led model, which really combines all of the above. Uh, so a cooperative leading from the community side, a mini grid operator with a little bit more control and investment from a larger SPV. Uh, I won't go into the details. This one's relatively complicated and something that probably wouldn't happen until farther down the line. Um, but connecting all that back to the productive use uh, point, which is great. 
So what this does, and I mentioned on the, the previous round of questions that these undergrid communities tend to be in, you know, relatively uh, more urban, they're not urban, but closer to urban locations with more access to infrastructure, there tends to be a fair amount of economic activity already. But a lot of that economic activity is powered by diesel gen sets rather than electricity, given the poor reliability of the grid. So there's a lot going on. It's just a matter of electrifying those end use appliances, um, particularly on the agriculture side. Uh, somewhere in this deck, we have a picture of a uh, community outside of Buja where you can just see piles of unmilled maize rolling out into the street where they're waiting for the power to come back on uh, for their electric mill. This is a really common issue. So what this does is it you know, uh, brings 24 seven reliability to the community at a reasonable tariff and it allows for those, uh, those commercial customers who are currently using diesel to electrify their appliances. And on the next question, I think we can get into some of the financial mechanisms that would allow that. Perfect, perfect, great. Um, thanks for that. And this is actually kind of this, I'm seeing in what you're doing in Nigeria, a lot of what we are also trying to explore in Uganda. And my next question is going to be for Florence again. And Florence, I'm wondering if you could um, talk to us about what are exactly are the business model innovations that we are exploring specifically in Uganda. And from a utilities perspective, how does this all, how does this, how does, how does the utility benefit from, from this? What, how does this help make your process um, for service delivery more effective? Florence? Thank you, Rebecca, for the question. And uh, I request that we put this next slide. Yeah, uh, uh, you, you'll see that uh, uh, in terms of uh, the models, uh, uh, as has been mentioned uh, by uh, the previous, by Jonathan, by uh, Pradeep, uh, we're working together with uh, um, uh, Utility 2.0. Uh, one of the models that we're looking at is uh, the modular solar mini grid, which, has, which will be implemented at one of the sites uh, and which will be built on the grid standards for easy and future grid integration. Uh, we're also looking at uh, partnerships uh, with a productive uh, uh, asset financers for demand stimulation. Uh, uh, productive use has already been talked about and uh, that is one of the areas that uh, we're looking at, uh, partnering in order to increase productive use by appliance financing. And uh, secondly, uh, looking at partnering uh, uh, with the with uh, with uh, uh, the agro processing uh, value chain, uh, how is that being done? Currently, with the agro processing value chain, from the research that was done in the area where we're going to pilot, we identified that the farmers are either using um, uh, diesel uh, 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 equipment powered by diesel to mill their grain. They are using rudimentary methods of uh, drying their maize. So one of the areas uh, that the consortia utility point always looking at is uh, to, to partner with them with equipment uh, that can improve uh, the quality uh, of their, their grain and uh, also improve the processes uh, in the value chain to give them more value. Um, it's important to note that these models are focused uh, on uh, where we have comparative advantage. That is uh, both the utility as well as the DREs. And uh, looking at uh, CAPEX, um, you can focus on the lowest CAPEX models. Uh, for example, I saw one of the questions uh, where um, uh, someone was asking why, uh, whether we are supporting um, uh, RARE to uh, scope and design the networks. So this is one of the areas where we as a utility have the expertise, and that's one of the areas that we can consider. And then uh, probably um, uh, the, the, the DREs uh, can focus uh, on the customer. Uh, and then the, in terms of the lowest uh, OPEX models, uh, things like um, the, the systems, the billing systems. Um, in the pilot project, initially we're looking at uh, uh, the DREs coming in with their own uh, billing system, whereas uh, we as a utility also have our own billing system. Is there opportunity to have a billing system that can serve across the country? And uh, that is one of the models that uh, uh, we would be considering. So uh, the pilot is enabling us, enabling us to shorten 
the learning curve as far as the integration is concerned uh, so that we can uh, be able to see what the benefits would be at scale in terms of creating uh, uh, channel two revenues as well as uh, shortening the learning curve. So those are the, uh, the models um, that we're looking at at Umemi. Thanks for that, Florence. And I think what, what hopefully the audience is seeing is uh, there are these direct commercial relationships, but there's also a lot of, I guess, what we can call indirect uh, strategy behind these business model innovations. So thinking about, as you're talking about, the billing, the collections, there's also, you know, um, working together on the marketing and the branding and so on. So I think that it's really interesting how we'll be able to pull together um, commercial uh, relationships between the utility and private private partners, um, private sector players, sorry, as well as these more indirect um, uh, opportunities as well. Uh, and that, that brings me to, um, to, to Jonathan. Um, so Jonathan, basically, as you know, our team at Power for All has been working with um, Umeme very closely and with your team at Duke on identifying what those commercial relationships are that make this all work, what Florence and, and the others have been describing. So there's the pilot model that Florence just described. Um, and then there are a couple of other ideas that might influence some next steps and how we can even further um, you know, innovate uh, business models. Could you just talk through what our research is showing so far as some plausible business models and how these are different from the IPP model? And I know we're short on time, so um, you don't have to get into too much detail. Right, sure. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really trying to get at some of the most binding constraints um, to lowering costs and bringing scale and how we can bring mini grids into this more integrated model. So if we're able to pull up this slide on CapEx, OpEx, cost of capital, I think this really tries, and this kind of drills down a little bit, I think it's the one before, into what Florence um, was talking about. Um, you know, in just, you know, two seconds on the IPP model, this is a tough business, right? This is a mini grid developer building, owning, operating the network, providing the service. They're responsible for, you know, raising the capital, the staff, servicing customers and the grid, you know, and sustaining all of that financially and operationally. Um, so there's a lot of risks associated with that business model. Um, and Florence took us through kind of um, phase one integration. I wanted to talk a little bit about phase two and phase three integration, which are sort of a little bit further out there. Um, they kind of work on spreadsheets, but it'll be exciting to, to road test them a little bit and get feedback from partners and see how they work in practice. Um, but first, just to give you an idea of what this model looks like, I'm not going to dive into numbers, but you know, if we're talking about upfront capital investment, the CapEx, if we look at that sensitivity bullet, a 50% CapEx reduction, if you can achieve it, can reduce your power costs by 40 to 60 cents a kilowatt hour. Now that, that'll give you an idea of what we're starting with in terms of costs. It's a big number, we're over a dollar per kilowatt hour on, on, on this. Um, and then, you know, operating costs. If you're able to get 20 to 25% OPEX reduction, what does that mean? Uh, it means a 30 to 60 cent per kilowatt hour cost reduction. And then cost of capital is really the interesting, interesting, most interesting from my perspective. Um, a 600 point um, or, you know, six percentage point reduction in capital costs. So if a mini grid developer has, you know, let's say 15% cost of capital, a new meme can, or a utility can get 9% cost of capital. And there's you know, or, or, or whatever the numbers are. Um, and there's a difference of that big of a difference in the cost of their capital, that leads to a potentially a 50 cent per kilowatt hour difference in the ultimate cost of power. So, um, you know, Florence walked us through what phase one of this pilot looks like. If we can go forward two slides, um, you know, level two, it builds on level one, right? And the most important difference, I'll just say, is replacing the custom engineered permanently installed generation assets with standardized, modular, lower cost generation uh, in a capital lease um, that allows uh, you know, for reduced upfront investment. So you're shipping, shifting CapEx to OpEx. Uh, and then you're bringing in a third partner that owns that equipment. Um, and then the third model, if we can briefly go to that, um, you're replacing the capital lease financing business model with a cash purchase generation 
um, asset model. Um, so that takes advantage of the utility's credit worthiness and purchasing power even more. Um, potentially, you know, you know, ultimately getting using this lower cost of capital to lower project costs. And you know, as I mentioned, these integration models. Um, you know, we have a policy brief coming out that I think for those interested who really want to, you know, get into the meat of this, we'll provide the numbers. But um, this is really a process, I think, is an important point to make. Um, each step is an increasing level of utility partnership. And, and with that sort of comfort and trust in not only working with a microgrid developer, but also an appliance provider and those renewable capital asset providers and others, um, expertise has to be built up. Um, so this is not a, you know, simple or something that happens overnight. Um, and I, I do think the difficult work is not, you know, building these spreadsheets and models, but it's, you know, it's ground truthing them and the hand-to-hand -hand combat with stakeholders as they wrestle with whether this is a commercially viable uh, business approach. And, and that's really what we're trying to get at with this, with this group, <clears throat> excuse me, this group of partners um, in Uganda. Thanks so much for that, Jonathan. And I think what this conversation is, is really showing us is that um, the integration is about the technologies, yes, but it's also about the ways in which the technology providers are interacting with each other. And it seems like there are ways that we can really optimize and streamline those relationships. Um, so I think we're just going to have one last round of questions because I want to talk about um, scale with you guys. And then I also want to get to our Q&A. If you, if you as a panelist can see, we have some fantastic questions in the Q&A. So I want to make sure we reserve some time for that. So let's let's go into one last round of questions. So, so, so um, speed answers here. And we're going to talk about scale. Because I think we've got some great suggestions and some great ideas coming to the table that are all we're starting to put into practice. But as we all know, um, we're going to need, um, you know, more to galvanize practitioners, donors, investors, policymakers, accelerate um, and to replicate and accelerate uh, 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 to get us to scale. Um, so let's talk about that for a second. Um, and uh, Florence, I'm going to come to you first and just ask, you know, technology and business models are one thing, but the enabling environment for all of this is another thing. So what are the, who are the key stakeholders that are involved um, outside of the utility and the private practitioners? And what's necessary from a regulatory point of view to de-risk replication and scale of these kinds of activities? Um, thank you, Rebecca, for the question. I think it's important uh, to understand uh, the way we are structured. And uh, this is the reason uh, um, why uh, we have been able to achieve, as we may the successes that I mentioned earlier before. Um, as you can see from the slide above, uh, we have uh, a generation. Um, as I indicated earlier, um, the sector was uh, uh, um, uh, reformed and uh, uh, split and bundled. Uh, where we have generation, uh, we have both private players uh, and government in there. Then we have uh, transmission. Uh, we operate a single buyer model. And uh, I'm mentioning these because all these are our stakeholders. And um, from there, we have uh, distribution. And uh, we are at the front line. We relate with the customers. But most importantly to note um, is the regulator uh, who uh, basically regulates everybody in this mix. And then we have a support agreement with government of Uganda. So it's very key to note um, that uh, these are all our key stakeholders. And um, what is it, um, uh, how, how can we work with these stakeholders in order to de-risk the replication? Most importantly is uh, uh, policy, as far as the energy policy is concerned. Uh, I'm aware that um, uh, there is a draft uh, energy policy 2019. So we need to look at frameworks, as we um, have talked about, uh, Jonathan talked about um, uh, frameworks to support um, uh, the integration, um, to encourage innovation. Uh, those frameworks need to be in place and they need to be provided for uh, under the energy policy, but also as part of regulation. We have two licenses, that is a distribution license and a supply license with the regulator. So we need to provide those frameworks. Uh, we have also seen frameworks as far as net metering. Uh, we, need to, we need to have uh, regulation and policy provide for those frameworks uh, so that we can be able uh, to de-risk um, 
uh, the replication of the innovation that we're talking about. Great, thanks for that, Florence. Um, Jonathan, I wanna to come to you next and ask um, a bit about on the finance side. Um, so from your work with the Minigrid Innovation Lab, I'm wondering if you could talk to us about how donor and government subsidy, kind of coming back to the topic that you were talking about at the very beginning, um, how subsidy and finance mechanisms can directly encourage um, business models that really prioritize and support the demand stimulation aspect that we were talking about in, in round two. Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, you know, we can use incentives, um, especially like a results based or an output based incentives to incentivize anything. You know, if, if we really want to get at productive use in the ag sector or we want to increase irrigation or we want to build out supply chains for light processing equipment or storage, you can put results based financing programs alongside any of those. I think the key thing to keep in mind is, you know, what are the ramifications of that? Because these are potentially very market disrupting incentives. And there are businesses who have built commercial um, models around, you know, what we have in place. Um, but I think if we are thoughtful about how subsidy can be applied, um, there's no reason that we can't get directly at some of these productive uses. And if, if I could, um, you know, Duke is part of a, um, a program that the Rockefeller Foundation has been supporting called the Minigrid, Minigrid Innovation Lab. And I wanted to share a quick slide here that gives you a flavor of what appliance um, financing programs are sort of looking like. Um, there was a pilot, and this was done in conjunction with the Rochester Institute of Technology, UMass Amherst and Cross Boundary, I should say, where villages that were getting new microgrid, mini grids, were um, able to buy on, on credit um, a group, a, a, a catalog of different appliances. And um, we were able to look at what was popular and what that did to demand on the system and what that did to you know, utility finances and have a few interesting takeaways on that. Um, so I don't know if this, if, uh, the mini grid innovation slide, slide, if that's handy, but one of the conclusions here is customers really wanted appliances. I mean, this, the program was oversubscribed um, and the data points to appliance financing being commercially viable, you know, even with, you know, 20% cost of capital and, uh, you know, getting your, uh, lending these at a 35% rate to annual rate to customers, there is a model and this is working in, in many places. A couple of things to be aware of, you know, power consumption initially went up about 66% in the, the trial villages, um, which is great. You know, people are using appliances, but after this, this demand, this consumption started to taper off. So about a year into it, we're seeing 20% um, we're seeing a 20% increase in consumption over baseline still, but after about a year and a half, we're down to baseline and we really need to understand this better. So, you know, is it that consumers can't afford their electricity bills um, with this added appliance load on it? Is it that, you know, the novelty of appliances have worn off? Um, or was there some seasonal effect here um, that's maybe temporary and, and consumption will go back up? Um, I think that, that this is an important area to understand as we're trying to, to you know, both program subsidy around productivity um, and also understand you know, what it is that, that consumers want and are willing to pay for. Um, you know, one last point here, the, the bottom chart, you see the daily load profile. This is a really important aspect for utility finances. If we're give, if we're, um, getting more appliances into the market that only boost that peak demand. So between the hours of five o'clock and, and eight o'clock, and you know people are using TVs and um, speaker systems and those types of appliances then, that's a really high cost on the utility to meet that demand. Whereas fridges, which is the, the box on the, the, the bottom right there, shows that there's a, a, an increased load during the day. And from a utility that's generating off of solar, that's where you want to be. You want to find those, um, you know, those power usages that match your um, generation. So I'll leave it there.
No, that's a great, I love these slides actually, um, because this is a really important point and that's part of what we're doing in Uganda as well as trying to make sure that we're matching um, demand and also looking for productive use applications that match the generation. Um, so I think that's, that's really, really well said. Um, because we asked James a double question earlier on, if it's okay with you, James, I'm just gonna ask one last question uh, to, to Pradeep and then we're gonna officially close the panel and move on to the Q&A. Um, Pradeep, I just, you know, given everything that, um, that Jonathan just said, more on the subsidy side, I'm wondering what do you think are we need financially to de-risk the integrated approach? So what specific interventions can come from donors, uh, investors, funders uh, to increase the pace of replication? I think if I, if I um, put myself in the shoes of, of, of the investors that are excited to work with us, they're excited about the approach that we're taking. They are excited about the support that we have from government. But then when it comes to the details, they're excited about the level of returns uh, from, from day one. And a lot of them are driven by the productive use component, frankly, but not necessarily at a household level. And so earlier you asked about scale. And I think we've discussed it in, in, in our smaller group where we're contributing and working together on the research. For us, any significant scalable electrification program needs to go hand in hand with an industrialization job creation program. Um, and so we are working, for example, with groups like DFID in Northern Nigeria to set up business parks that can attract you know, the big uh, industrial agro-processing companies, entrepreneurs that can operate at a scale which will drive those anchor loads that will justify the investment for the most part, that will make the investment bankable in the short to medium term. Now, look, nobody in their sane mind will invest private capital seeking a commercial return in a distribution business in Africa without certain of these principles, certain of these must haves in place. And so the anchor loads, the commercial and industrial customers that are bankable, that drive the large percentage of the revenues make our investors comfortable. That gives us the ability to attract the capital and then not only invest the generation, the network, but also serve the urban residential customers that take a while to build a relationship with and take a while to get into the habit of paying their bills when they haven't paid them for a while and get in the habit of then increasing their demand through appliances and finding out where the right balance is. Our investment case is not driven by those customers that are the most difficult. Our investment case is definitely not driven by the eight mini grids that we want to roll out. The eight mini grids are very important for energy access, but are a positive rounding error in the context of the overall project. And so I think we will have a challenge when it comes to scale as to finding that right mix in terms of customer mix. But that's where smart subsidies come in. That's where foreign direct investment comes in. That's where the government can also be smarter. Now that we've proven the fundamentals of the model, then we can tweak it further. Um, and I think that's what will be required. I don't think, you know, utility 2.0 is, is, is the end of it. I think it's, it's the start of an evolution or revolution, as Christina would say, but it's definitely, you know, we've got a few more steps to take. This is just kind of providing comfort to investors in a sector that has been underinvested for years and years. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Pradeep. And thank you uh, to all of our panelists for this uh, really interesting discussion around uh, business model innovation. I'm going to jump right into the Q&A. We've got tons of questions coming in from both the Facebook and the Zoom. One question that's coming up quite a bit is, what is the role of solar home systems and standalone solar uh, as we think about and consider the integrated approach. 
But if, since you just had the, the floor, do you want to talk about that um, in Nigeria? And then maybe Florence, I'll come to you as well to answer this question. Did you say I should answer that? If you want to take a stab at it, sure, just from the Nigeria point of view. And if, if, yeah. if the home systems play a role in, in Connexus. Uh, um, Absolutely, they do. You know, when you, when you look at an integrated model and you look at the lowest cost of electrification, there are places where the grid extension makes sense. And historically, utilities have only had one tool in their toolbox to reach customers, which is grid and grid extension. Today, through a model like Connexa, we've added more tools to that toolbox. Where it makes sense, we can deploy mini grids and not have to incur the costs, the, the increased cost of extending the grid. Over time, we can even explore whether it makes sense for that mini grid to remain standalone or be interconnected. Similarly, where the mini grids don't make sense, we can definitely serve that same customer using standalone systems, which now come in different sizes, shapes, colors, with appliances, without appliances. There's a lot there that we can use and always comparing that to, number one, what the customer needs and comparing it to what solutions are available in the context of the network. Ultimately, the utility is managing a network. And I think the standalone systems have a role to play in that network planning and operations. Great, thanks for that. Um, Florence, uh, questions for you. Uh, there's a lot of questions around tariffs. Um, so one question is, how can the benefits that the investors are reaping, um, especially in Uganda, be translated to lower tariffs for electricity? And another question similarly is around looking at the electricity consumers in the mini grid um, versus the main grid, are the, are the tariffs the same, assuming that the consumption of those two consumers would be the same? Could you talk to us a little bit about the tariffs and the potential for bringing tariffs down through these integrated approaches? Okay, I, I think I, I missed the last question, but I'll start with the, the, the question on the tariffs and uh, what uh, uh, probably the investors are benefiting. And uh, it's against that background that I did share uh, the first slide. Uh, what I didn't mention is that uh, at the start of the concession, uh, in, uh, 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 this basically the utility, the grid losses were at 38%. And uh, right now, as we speak, as at the end of 2019, the grid losses were at 16.5%. Uh, 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 at the start of uh, uh, the concession, um, uh, supply reliability was poor. Uh, that basically, there was no investment in the network. So uh, it's important uh, to understand um, that uh, with creating efficiencies, the collection rates uh, were just seated at about uh, 85%. Now, as we speak, the collection rates are standing at about uh, 95%. So before Umeme came in, up to 2012, government of Uganda was spending about $90 million annually on subsidies. So with the creating of these efficiencies, the benefit directly feeds into the tariff. So, um, what has the investor done? And that was the main purpose of the unbundling of the reforms, to create that transparency, but to also attract investment. At the time of the reforms, government did not have enough money to continue uh, sinking into the sector, whereas we're in the situation where the economy was growing above 6%, uh, but the engine for that growth, which was uh, power, uh, government did not have enough money to invest in generation plants. So because of the performance of Umeme, uh, this has freed up um, uh, uh, revenues or money uh, where government has now been able to invest, invest in generation plants and where the efficiencies have directly contributed to lowering the tariff. If we had the performance on losses as it is, uh, as it were right now, uh, the impact on the tariff uh, would be significant. Mm -hmm. So in terms of benefit to the customer, as far as the efficiencies are concerned, it has a direct impact on the tariff. The increase in sales compared uh, uh, to, to where we are, we had 300,000 customers uh, when we started. Right now, we have close to 1.5 million customers. So uh, 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 it's important for us to understand that the efficiencies, definitely the investor has to get value 
because uh, we are using the investors' money to deliver the efficiencies that I've mentioned that have a direct impact on the tariff. And what does the customer want? The customer wants reliable power. Uh, so it doesn't make sense uh, for industry to have supply available without investing to be able to deliver reliable power. As we speak right now, there is a framework that has been put in place to be able to uh, 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 make sure that uh, we improve reliability and there are penalties and of course incentives for delivering reliability. But all those, as far as the customer is concerned, have a positive impact as far as uh, value for the customer is concerned. And when you asked, uh, how do we de-risk um, uh, scaling up of these innovation that we are coming up? The focus in whatever we do should be on the customer. If the customer can get value, price becomes relative. And it's also important to note that we do have a lifeline tariff where the poorest of the poor uh, uh, is catered for. Thanks for that, Florence. And we're hearing that increased sales and the performance gains should definitely feed directly into the, the tariff. Um, I'm just looking at the time and I just want to make a just a quick announcement to our audience uh, for those of, we're going to stay and just answer questions there's so many that are coming through here so we'll stay a few more minutes if our panelists are right with that and answer a few more questions. Uh, the panelists have also agreed um, to answer those questions that we're not able to get through today through email so we'll be we'll be in touch. Um, feel free to engage with us on social media if there's other questions that you'd like to ask. Um, and the results of our last poll just show that, you know, people would really like to stay engaged through webinar, through other webinars like this, through progress reports, inside briefs, and so on. So, you know, please expect to hear more from us. But we're going to continue with some, a few more questions. I want to touch on that last, last point that you just made, Florence, about the community. And, and James, maybe you might be well-placed uh, to answer this question that's coming into us from Facebook Live, which is, in implementing these approaches, how do the utilities and or the developers encourage participatory approaches in building out the business models with the community and local government? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think what, what we've seen that has worked well in Nigeria, especially, but also in Ethiopia, is really including the community right from the start. So not doing a lot of design and you know, creating systems or programs uh, you know, from an office or from an ivory tower <laughs> perspective, but actually going out and meeting with community members, understanding what their real needs are and testing the ideas with them and saying, you know, this is what we're proposing. Does that make sense to you? And sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes it's no, I think we've, you know, heard strong, <laughs> strong reactions on both sides. So to me, that's what I've seen work the best is, you know, whether it's through the utility area offices, through joint site visits with uh, mini grid developers uh, through kind of more community style forums, uh, just getting out and meeting with the community leadership and actually understanding what's going on uh, in those communities firsthand is really what I've seen be the most successful approach. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, James, you might actually be well placed to answer this next question too, um, which I think is so well phrased. Um, so this this is coming to us from California and it says, um, we appreciate the staged and integrated approach for using mini grids uh, and DRE to increase access, but how do you think about when the transition begins? So from connected to unconnected, and is this choice based on distance? Is it based on cost, population density, load? Um, in your very, very early slides when you were talking to us about the undergrid mini grid um, model, you mentioned that these can be sort of connected, disconnected. What's the, what's the when and what are the determining factors there? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a, well, it's a great question. It is certainly going to vary country to country, depending on the system and uh, what the utility's ability to invest in grid extension looks like. Uh, so I'll, I'll speak specifically to Nigeria, but then uh, would love to hear Florence and Jonathan and others uh, chime in from other perspectives. But in Nigeria, I think the decision making comes down largely to uh, what what is the current level of reliability in these communities or in, in a given community. So the lower the reliability, the more sense it makes to uh, install an undergrid mini grid or some other approach to provide electricity. Uh, 
the level of diesel consumption or diesel genset use in the com in the community is a huge factor as well and uh the tariffs that the community is paying on average so whether the, really the level of subsidy involved in the tariffs and looking at those three things uh is the predominant factor distance from the grid is is less a factor if we're talking about going from grid connected to grid unconnected or semi-connected um obviously the the uh, situation flips around though if we're talking about just grid extension to off-grid or unconnected communities. Great, thank you for that. Florence, um, a couple of questions are coming in for Umemi on, on productivity and I think people are really responding to this issue on, on, uh, of demand stimulation. So there's a, a question around, um, you know, what productive uses or assets uh, is Umemi uh, engaged in? Um, uh, outside of agro-processing. Uh, and then the other question is around um, whether or not the utility might even think of itself as an entrepreneur in the space of productive use and perhaps, you know, um, offer agricultural and productive use appliances with, coupled with electricity to improve income generation and that kind of thing. Is this a, is this a, is this a line of, 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 of thinking and innovation that you think Umeme is, is considering currently? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. And uh, right now, uh, we, are, we, we are in a space where we are exploring uh, opportunities based on the challenge that we see, as I mentioned, as far as uh, demand as you go further to the grid edge is concerned. It's against that background. Uh, um, uh, we are utility, but there is opportunity to partner uh, with uh, companies uh, who are part of this consortia that are already doing appliance financing. Uh, from a site uh, that, uh, that uh, we, 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 where research was carried out uh, that had had power for five years, uh, we did establish that it takes four years um, to increase uh, consumption from uh, about 50 kilowatt hours uh, annually to 200 kilowatt hours annually. And uh, our understanding together with the consortia uh, what we established is um, when customers um, uh, get access to electricity, initially uh, they probably because of the income levels, they do not have um, uh, the, 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 the capability uh, to, to use the power productively um, or because they don't have the assets, they don't have the equipment. So it's against this background that uh, we are testing to see the impact from the initial findings uh, uh, as far as the modeling is concerned, we did establish that uh, the impact uh, of deploying these products, uh, the assets would be ranging from about two megawatts to about 24 megawatts annually. So should this, uh, once we carry out the tests, should this, uh, uh, should it confirm that actually this is the case, this is an area uh, whereby as a utility will determine where do we have comparative advantage um, so that we can be able to focus uh, where we need, which area we need to uh, uh, dive in. But for now, uh, we are partnering with uh, uh, Utility 2.0 to be able to explore those opportunities. Great, thank you. Thanks for that, Florence. Um, one last question, and, I'm, and I think everybody on the panel could be free to answer this question. Um, there's a few coming in, obviously, around COVID and uh, how COVID-19 might delay or change any of these efforts around integration and also around community engagement. So perhaps, I guess, as our last question, um, we started ten minutes late, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap uh, we're gonna wrap just after this one. Maybe if each of you just want to take a a, a chance and talk about um, in our current state of affairs how COVID might affect um, your ability to to carry out these these approaches. Um, uh, maybe uh, Pradeep, we can start with you, and then we go to James, and then and then Florence and Jonathan. Yeah, we've been, we've been watching this quite closely, as you can as you can imagine, and perhaps some of the parallels that we're seeing where where data exists is in a lot of the utilities in uh, perhaps uh, other markets like the UK or the US. We've seen energy demand completely dive as a result of industrial and commercial activity slowing down. Um, and we don't know what the recovery period for that will be. I assume uh, that the impact of COVID will be very similar in uh, Nigeria. And 
you know, as I said earlier, given industrial and commercial customers are such a key part of our value proposition, of our financial stack, we are a little bit concerned as to, you know, the, the dip in demand from their side directly affects our revenues. Um, and so that's something that we're watching. Of course, the other benefit is that anyone that's in a utility business is in it for the long term. You know, our concession period is 20, 25 years. So I hope this will be a kind of short term dip in the context of things. The other thing is that a lot of the utilities in Africa rely on some kind of in international intervention for due diligence, for technical assistance, for investors, etc. And travel restrictions are just a reality that we're having to also learn to work with. But beyond a certain point, you can't really operate a utility without being on the ground. Um, you know, as, as much fun as the technology advances have been so too far to date, you've got to interact with those customers. You've got to show your faces to build that trust. So, you know, a few challenges ahead and we're just learning as to how we're going to work with that. Lawrence or, or James? Um, yes, um, definitely we are not an island, so we suffered the same in terms of uh, deep in uh, demand. Uh, but, but glad to say that uh, the curve is changing now with the easing of the lockdown. Uh, we are seeing demand picking up, particularly with the industries. We have seen a couple of industries uh, going into areas uh, like producing uh, masks and so on that they were not. But also um, the fact that uh, uh, our borders are still open, much as look uh, in uh, within the region, much as uh, um, uh, definitely a couple of businesses suffered, like uh, horticulture, like uh, the hospitality industry, uh, manufacturing is picking up, which is a positive. But definitely um, uh, our our in, uh, our business, our the work that we're doing with Utility 2.4 has been affected because we have key partners and one of the major key stakeholders that we have are the customers, um, the people on the ground where the pilot is going to be carried out. We are at a stage where we are nearing um, the process uh, of implementation mm -hmm. where we needed to engage the people on the ground so that they get a buy-in. They were really excited um, to know, to learn that um, uh, electricity was coming closer to them. We are having deep discussion with the rural electrification so um, definitely during the, um, the lockdown, all these were not accessible, but glad to note that uh, in the new normal, we are now uh, accessing our key stakeholders online, the regulator and so on and so forth. But as far as um, the actual implementation on the ground, where we need to engage with the community to build their trust, that will definitely be impacted. But uh, glad to note that uh, things are getting back to no yeah. one hoping that this does not change because it's unpredictable. That's a very hopeful response. I really appreciate uh, that good energy, Florence. Um, James or Jonathan, from you guys as well, any thoughts on, on COVID and how that would affect work on the ground? Well, I, to me, low-hanging fruit here is health facilities. Um, a quarter of health facilities in Africa have no power. More than half of them have unreliable power. So if we're thinking about, you know, how do we put people back to work? You know, orders for systems are in a lull. They're gonna be down over the next year. So you've got slack capacity in the system. So a good way to get people to work while increasing the near-term ability for health facilities to respond and be able to, you know, you can't even do a COVID test without electricity, right? Um, let alone provide all the different levels of treatment and care that go with it. So. To me, um, powering health facilities in the near term is something that is good from an economic perspective. You can build electrification strategies around that. Um, and over the long term, that's the way to ensure that there's a more resilient health system. So this is the classic breaking down of the silos. And um, you know, it's good to see USAID, World Bank, some others are getting getting on this train like now, because um, it's, it's a low hanging fruit from my perspective. It's hard to build on on that one. I'll just point out one other thing with particularly with rural communities that uh, we're paying attention to and I know all of our partners uh, are as well as ensuring that we're really careful with uh, 
not accidentally taking the virus from an urban place to a rural place. And so with site visits and uh, system construction, I know that's something that we're keenly aware of and others in the sector are paying attention to. So as the situation unfolds, we'll be continuing to monitor that and make sure that there's no unintended consequences. Fantastic. Great. Well, with that, I think we're, we're just at, at time here and apologies to our audience for going a little bit over. Um, we started a little bit late. Um, so to our panelists, let me just say thank you for such an engaged conversation. Um, I think that what we've been hearing over the past uh, 90 minutes is that innovations in business and not just the technology is really what's happening here and that these integrated approaches are about access, but also more than that, it's not access as an end in itself. We're really thinking about how to focus on customer development and have productivity baked into the bottom line. Um, so these are all pioneering adventures um, and we know much more is needed um, to galvanize um, and create momentum around scale. So thank you for all of, all of the thoughts about how exactly to do that. Um, and thank you to our audience who's asked a, a number of really fantastic questions. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to respond uh, to those questions that we didn't get to today. There's just a few. Um, we'll respond to those by email. We'll also send out the video link to this webinar and we will send out um, the slides because uh, a couple of people were asking about slides and links to reports and so on. So we will be in touch again through email. Um, with that, I think I'd like to say thank you to everyone for, for joining and you will be hearing from us again. And hopefully, you know, as EEG said at the beginning, this is just the first of many um, webinars and, uh, and um, engagements on the topic of integrated energy. Uh, so thanks everyone. Be safe wherever you are. Um, take care and um, we'll see you again soon. Thank you.